Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Sam Funds webinar, first part in a two-part series about building a family after cancer treatment. My name is Samantha Watson. I'm the executive director of the Sam Fund, and with me is Michelle Zietler, our program director. Hello. Just to give you a quick overview of how this process is going to work, um, for those who maybe haven't participated in the webinar, you should all see um, a screen on your computer right now that has our logo, um, the title of the webinar. And basically, it will just be like watching a PowerPoint presentation. You'll notice in the control panel on the right side of your screen, there's an opportunity for you to type in questions should they come up during the webinar. So Michelle will see those questions, and she'll either respond to you directly or she'll present them more publicly if, um, if it's something for either of our presenters to address. And if by the end of this webinar your question hasn't been answered, feel free to email us and we will link you up with the right people to find the information you need. So this webinar is going to last 90 minutes and we have a lot to cover, so we're going to jump right in. The Samplin's webinar series, Moving Forward with Your Financial Health, was launched about a year ago in an attempt to address some of the most frequently faced challenges, questions, concerns within the young adult survivor community. One of the biggest, most frequently asked questions, um, one of the most common challenges that young adults face, as you all know because you're here today, is about family building, specifically about fertility. If our fertility has been impacted by cancer treatment or has a high likely, likelihood of being impacted in the future, young adults want to know if they can still be parents, if there are ways to start a family other than the traditional way. And the answer to that is yes. We're very, very proud to present this webinar today because Joanne Calvin and Mindy Bergson are two of the most fantastic, experienced, um, just some of the smartest people that we know, basically, to provide guidance not only on how people can start a family when their fertility has been impacted, but also, as Mindy will deal with, ways to finance it because anything other than the, than the traditional way of starting a family can be pretty pricey. But Mindy's here to share her guidance with respect to different ways to finance different um, fertility processes and options. So with that, we will jump right in. I want to introduce both of our presenters. Joanne will go first, and then Mindy will go um, afterwards. Joanne Frankel Calvin is a clinical nurse specialist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City, where she established the Cancer and Fertility Program to ensure that patients are informed about options for fertility preservation for cancer treatment and for building a family after treatment. Joanne is a member of the Livestrong Fertility Advisory Group and is a co-investigator on an R25 training grant that was developed by Moffitt Cancer Center to educate nurses about cancer and fertility. Mindy Bergson, our second presenter, founded Lotus Blossom Consulting to help intended parents globally explore their options for biological families in the U.S. Through strong strategic alliances, Lotus Blossom consultants bring together the unbiased resources and professionals necessary to accomplish the end family building goal and serve as a guide through the often stressful financial, physical, and emotional demands of the infertility process. So she will tell you more about her organization. First, I want to introduce Joanne and to both of you. Thank you so, so much for dedicating your time to be with us today and for sharing your expertise with our participants. So Joanne, I will turn it over to you. So, hmm, are you guys seeing the, are you seeing that, um, Let's click on show my screen, Joanne. Are you seeing that? No. Or are you seeing my slides? I'm sorry, what? I think we're still seeing my screen. There we are. Okay. And are you seeing the panel on the right or are you seeing the PowerPoint alone? No, we see the PowerPoint. You're all set. Great. Um, so uh, thank you so much for inviting me and for that nice welcome. Um, I am going to uh, – so now this isn't working. Sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry. So I'm going to start with some basics about the structures involved in reproduction, um, briefly describe the effects of various cancer treatments on fertility, and then focus on different options for building a family. And throughout the presentation, I'm going to stop periodically to give you a chance to ask any questions you have. So first, we're going to look at women. 
So here you can see on the left um, the female reproductive structures in the pelvis. And I'm going to focus on the ovaries. And you can think of each ovary as being like an orange. The outer peel of the orange is comparable to the cortex of the ovary. And that's where all the eggs are found. Each egg is in its own sac called a follicle. And most of the follicles in the ovary are very small and in a dormant or resting phase. Once puberty begins, hormones stimulate some of the follicles to begin maturing each month. It actually takes six months for an egg to fully mature, and you can see these enlarged follicles here with one maturing egg inside each. Now, the number of eggs or follicles we have at any one time is called the ovarian reserve. And I want to show you this graph so you can see how our ovarian reserve changes as we age. The vertical axis shows you the increasing number of follicles, and the horizontal ax axis shows you increasing age. Now, baby girls are born with about one million follicles, and unfortunately, this is all we get. We don't make any new eggs during our lifetime. And in fact, these follicles and eggs naturally break down and degenerate as we age. So we lose eggs continuously as we get older. Now, with the loss of eggs, we lose our fertility and eventually go into menopause. So as you can see here, women lose fertility about 5 to 10 years before they go into menopause. So continuing to have monthly periods doesn't ensure that a woman is fertile. Now, women can have impaired fertility for a variety of reasons that have nothing to do with cancer treatment. Age is clearly a major factor, as you've just seen. But also, women who are overweight and who smoke are at risk for problems conceiving. And these are things, obviously, in your control. Um, and of course, there are a variety of other fertility problems that may exist that have nothing to do with cancer or cancer treatment. And in fact, if you've never tried to get pregnant, you may not be aware of these. Now, in thinking about your options for building a family after cancer, it's important to understand how your individual treatment may have affected you. Now, surgical removal of reproductive structures can have an ability on, may have an impact on your ability to produce eggs, to conceive naturally, or carry pregnancy, depending on the specific surgery you had. Um, and I'm just going to mention a couple of things based on the surveys that you um, filled out beforehand to try to address everybody's unique situation. So, for example, one type of surgery for early stage um, cervical cancer is a trachelectomy, where instead of removing the entire uterus, just the cervix is removed. And so, um, although by maintain, keeping the uterus, you can still carry a pregnancy, but because the shape of that has been altered, it would be a high-risk pregnancy and one that needs to be monitored very closely. Another example of surgery that isn't perhaps very obvious in terms of its effect on fertility is that some women who have had radiation to the pelvis had their ovaries moved out of the treatment field before treatment. That's called ovarian transposition. And so this reduces the amount of radiation that the ovaries receive. But because the ovaries have been moved, um, you may not be able to get pregnant naturally and may need to have some assisted reproductive technology to assist you with that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the future. Now, chemotherapy with certain drugs and radiation treatment to an area that includes the ovaries can destroy eggs, leading to a reduction in your ovarian reserve. And so this can cause a premature ovarian failure with infertility and menopause beginning at an earlier age. We don't know for sure how hormonal therapy affects fertility. We don't know if it destroys eggs or changes other factors in the ovary, but we do know that women who have been treated with tamoxifen for breast cancer tend to have an early menopause. And also, because it's generally given for a full five years, and it's very important not to get pregnant while you're on tamoxifen, because getting pregnant on tamoxifen is known to lead to birth defects. Um, this will delay childbearing, and so age itself may have the most significant impact on your fertility. Um, high doses of radiation to an area that includes the uterus can cause fibrosis or scarring of the uterus. Changes um, in the endometrial lining of the uterus can make it difficult for an embryo to implant, and changes in the uterine muscle 
will make it less elastic and unable to accommodate the growing fetus. And finally, surgery or radiation to the brain that affects the pituitary gland um, is important to consider because this gland secretes hormones that regulate the menstrual cycle. And if the cycle is disrupted, the follicles um, and eggs may not mature the way they normally would. Now, before moving on to an introduction about men, I wanted to just stop here and see if anyone had any questions. No, so far we haven't gotten any. Okay, so here you can see the male reproductive structures in the pelvis. Um, sperm are produced in the testes, which are filled with very small tubules. And if we look at a cross-section of an individual tubule, you can see see that it's filled with a lot of cells. The outer cells are germ cells, sorry. The outer cells are germ cells that, unlike eggs, are able to constantly replicate to make new germ cells. And some of these cells will actually develop and mature into sperm that are pushed into the center of the tubule. And sorry, my animation isn't working. There we go. And then these sperm then are kind of pushed through the tubules and stored in the epididymis. Now here's the ductal system through which the sperm and fluids are propelled as semen out of the tip of the penis each time a male ejaculates. ejaculates. Now men can also have impaired fertility for reasons that have nothing to do with cancer treatment. Men who are overweight and who smoke are at risk. And in addition, um, use of certain illegal drugs, as well as anabolic steroids that some young men use to build up their muscles, are known to impair fertility. And so all these things are certainly within your control. Um, but as with women, there may be pre-existing fertility problems that you may or may not be aware of that have nothing to do with a diagnosis of cancer or with cancer treatment. Um, and as with women, in thinking about a man's options for building a family after cancer treatment, it's equally important to understand how treatment may have affected you. Surgical removal of reproductive structures or damage to the nerves and ducts in the pelvis can have an impact on your ability to produce sperm or to deliver sperm to your partner, depending on the specific surgery you had. <coughs> Chemotherapy with certain drugs and radiation treatment to an area that includes the testes will lead to destruction of germ cells and impaired sperm production. Now, if some of the germ cells survive, they may begin to replicate again after treatment. So men, some men will recover the ability to produce sperm. For most men who have recovery, this occurs within one to three years of treatment but for others, it can take much longer, as long as 15 years. Radiation damage to structures in the pelvis can lead to erectile dysfunction or ejaculatory changes. Now, these in and of themselves have no impact on sperm production, but with problems with erection or ejaculation, it will impair your ability to just deliver sperm to your partner through intercourse. And finally, radiation or surgery in the brain, as with women, can affect the pituitary gland. In men, this gland secretes hormones that regulate sperm production, and a decrease in these hormones may affect fertility. Um, any questions before I go on? Um, we did have one question, um, sort of unrelated, but someone wanted to know if Lupron was considered hormonal therapy. Okay, so um, Lupron is given to some women to suppress ovarian function. The idea being that if you kind of shut down the menstrual cycle and keep all of those follicles in that little tiny dormant phase, that perhaps you'll protect them from the effects of chemotherapy. Um, we know that Lupron does not work with men, and we know that Lupron does not work with radiation exposure, but there has been some data showing that it is helpful for women. Um, well, actually, I should say there's conflicting reports. Some research studies show that for women, it can help to preserve fertility. So it's not a hormonal treatment of your cancer. It's used to suppress the ovaries with the hope that it will help in preserving fertility. And so it has no impact on fertility in the future 
hopefully it will um, maintain your fertility and prevent early menopause. But again, the research data is rather con um, contradictory and conflicting about that. But it certainly won't have a negative effect on fertility. Thanks, Joanne. So in both men and women, because of the many factors involved, it's impossible to predict with certainty who's going to have fertility problems afterwards. The only thing we do know is that older women are definitely at increased risk. And based on the specific drugs um, that you received, um, there are certain drugs that are known to have increased risk, particularly at higher doses. And um, as with radiation, you know, higher doses are create more of a risk than lower doses. But we still can't know for certain what's going to happen to any one individual. The other thing that's important to keep in mind that this is often not an all or nothing phenomenon. Some people may have difficulty conceiving or getting pregnant naturally, but may be successful with some of the new technology that's available to assist with reproduction. And another issue that's important to keep in mind is timing. Many women will be fertile after treatment, but because of early menopause, they're going to have a shorter window of time during which they'll be able to get pregnant. On the other hand, men may be infertile after treatment, but because of the potential for recover, recovery, may be able to produce sperm in the future. Now, some people may want to try to get pregnant on their own before seeking any kind of fertility services, and that's obviously fine, but when you're ready to attempt pregnancy, there are a few things to keep in mind. First, and most important, is to check with your oncologist about how long to wait after treatment. Most patients are recommended to wait at least one to two years. Now, this time allows for any sperm or eggs that have been exposed and damaged by chemotherapy or radiation to be cleared from your body because you wouldn't want to conceive with damaged eggs or sperm because of the potential risk to the health of the child. Another consideration for women is that pregnancy can put a significant stress on the body. So it's important to have time for you to completely recover from the effects of your treatment before you attempt pregnancy. And another important reason to wait a period of time is that this allows you to move past the period during which you may be at risk for an early recurrence or relapse. And we wouldn't want you or your partner to be pregnant and then to find out that you need additional treatment. Now, how long you should try on your own depends on your age or your female partner's age because of the natural loss of fertility as women age. Another issue to consider in regard to pregnancy for female survivors is the impact of the potential long-term or late effects of your cancer treatment, such as heart, lung, kidney, or other effects. You should ask your doctor if you would be considered a high-risk pregnancy because of your prior treatment. And if yes, you should consider seeing a maternal fetal medicine specialist before you attempt getting pregnant. These are obstetricians who work with women who are at high risk of complications during pregnancy. They'll discuss your risks based on your prior treatment and the safety of attempting pregnancy. And if you do go ahead and get pregnant, they'll follow you closely throughout the pregnancy to identify any treatment, any problems that may arise to protect your health and your baby's health. So um, I'm going to now kind of switch and focus on female um, survivors and talk about options. But before I move ahead, any questions about um, what I talked about just now? Um, I don't oh, – hold on. We just had one more question come in. Let me take a look at it. Um, one person said that she's been hearing very different timelines, uh, very different opinions about her timeline to try to conceive. Her primary care doctor says she should have started yesterday because if she has issues conceiving, the fertility specialist won't want to start working with me after 35, and she's 31 now. She says, um, can or should I see a fertility specialist now before trying to get pregnant? So this is kind of a difficult question because you need to balance two things. You definitely want to be past a period of time where you'd be getting pregnant with potentially damaged eggs. So you definitely need to wait a minimal period of time. 
you have to balance waiting enough time with your age and your risk of infertility and potentially <coughs> early menopause as you get older. And she's um, sorry, Joanne. She says she, to clarify, she says she's she's eight years post treatment, but certainly you should feel free to answer it more generally. Okay. So. Um, Obviously, there's no risk for you trying to get pregnant now. Who is somebody wait, telling you to wait? Long, well, I don't want to get into a whole thing to distract from the group, but eight years post treatment is certainly plenty of time to wait. I think if the oncologist is recommending waiting even longer, I think that that is um, something you need to bring back to the oncologist. And I understand the internet, the um, your primary care providers. Uh, message to get started as soon as possible, but you also don't want to have a child until you're ready in your life to have a child. And I am going to talk um, a little bit further down what young women should do who are worried about early menopause but not yet ready to have a child and how to balance that. So hopefully I'll be able to answer that in, in a little bit of time. And if I still haven't answered that question, maybe we can go back to that at the end, okay? Okay, we did. We just had a couple more um, trickle in here. Um, somebody asked, "How do you know if you're still fertile? What tests are involved?" I'm, I'm going sure to address gonna talk, that. I'm going to talk about that in the next section. Terrific. And then um, the last question here: If a provider doesn't mention the risk of infertility, but then a patient does become um, does, does experience infertility, is the provider liable? And that may not be a question you know the answer to, but um, or well, I'm. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to plead the fifth on that. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, it, no, honestly, there are um, definitely um, increasing numbers of professional um, organizations that advocate the importance for oncology clinicians to inform their patients about risks of infertility and options to preserve fertility. But these are guidelines, and um, they're not, you know, it's not a law. And, you know, I, I think that if someone feels they weren't adequately informed, probably the first place to start would be going back to your oncologist to find out why that information was, was not provided because there may have been a very legitimate reason why it wasn't really discussed, which I could not speak to. Okay. Thank you very um, much. Okay. So, um, so now I'm going to talk about the options for women, including evaluation, and then we'll switch over to men after this. So if you're not able to get pregnant after trying no more than three to six months, or if you wanted to be evaluated before you even try, you need to start by scheduling an appointment with a reproductive endocrinologist. These are gynecologists who specialize in fertility, and they will perform ovarian reserve testing to evaluate the number and quality of your eggs. Now, there are a number of tests involved. First is a transvaginal ultrasound. This uses a thin probe placed in the vagina. Sound waves are emitted from the probe and bounce off of the structures in the pelvis to create images of the ovaries in the uterus. And here you can see what an image of the ovary would look like. This is a single ovary, and each of the dark spots you see is one of those mature follicles that I showed you in a schematic illustration earlier. And so what they do during the transvaginal ultrasound is an ovarian antral follicle count. And they know, based on your age, what they would expect to see as the number of mature follicles. And so they would compare what they see with you with what would be expected at your age. They'll also look at hormone levels, particularly the anti-malarian hormone and the follicle-stimulating hormone. Anti-malarian hormone is actually one of the newer hormones, and it's felt to be a little bit um, better as an indicator of fertility than the follicle-stimulating hormone because that hormone, FSH, tends to fluctuate quite a lot during the menstrual cycle, and AMH does not fluctuate. So it's probably a little more reliable indicator. Also, if you had any surgery or radiation to the brain and there's any concern about your pituitary gland function, they'll also be able to evaluate that. Now, these tests together help determine the likelihood of your success in becoming pregnant. But this evaluation really focuses on the number of eggs and the quality of the eggs. It's not an extensive 
fertility evaluation. And so if you've been trying to get pregnant unsuccessfully, you may need other tests to see if there are other factors that are contributing to this above and beyond your cancer treatment. Now, based on the results of your fertility evaluation, your doctor will outline your options. So we'll walk through each of these. Now, first is intrauterine insemination, which involves inserting your partner's or a donor's semen directly into your uterus. And this can be used for a variety of fertility issues that are generally not related to cancer treatment. It is um, in, in women with no fertility problems at all, it can take as many as three to six attempts um, at intrauterine insemination before um, a pregnancy results. Um, women who have low ovarian reserve may respond to ovarian stimulation, which involves taking hormones to stimulate the eggs to develop and improve the chance you can get pregnant with intercourse. Most women with low ovarian reserve are not going to respond to this and are going to need a more um, aggressive uh, treatment to be successful. And what's most commonly used is referred to as in vitro fertilization or IVF. It's a combination of stimulation with fertilizing an egg in the laboratory rather than through intercourse. So basically I'm going to walk you through what's involved here. Beginning on the second or third day of your period, you would take hormone injections each day for about 10 to 14 days. These will stimulate the developing eggs in your ovaries to fully mature. The nurses will teach you how to inject yourself. Now, in, to ensure the ovaries responding well, during this 10 to 14 days, you're going to be monitored almost every day by the reproductive endocrinologist. They'll repeat the transvaginal ultrasound and the blood test to see how you're responding to the hormone injections. And based on how you're responding, they'll change the dose of medication day to day so that they can get the best response. And the image you see here is what a typical ovary might look like um, on ultrasound after receiving these hormone injections because you can see that there's many large maturing follicles here. Now, once the eggs have matured, which, as I said, can take uh, 10 days to 14 days, you're scheduled to have the egg retrieval. This is an outpatient procedure done with anesthesia. Um, it's usually done in, in an operating room to have a sterile environment, and the anesthesia will completely knock you out. You'll be sound asleep. You won't feel a thing or move at all. Um, there's no surgery involved, though. This is done all through the vagina. An ultrasound probe is placed in the vagina so that the ovaries can be visualized, and then a thin needle is passed through the wall of the vagina up to the ovary. The needle punctures each follicle, um, and the egg is drawn out. And after all the mature eggs are removed from one ovary, the needle is repositioned, and the mature eggs are removed from the other ovary. The whole process takes about 15 minutes, and after you wake up from the procedure, you go home. The eggs are brought into the laboratory where each egg is fertilized with sperm, and this is what IVF is, in vitro fertilization, just means fertilization in the laboratory. Now, you can use sperm from your husband or partner, or you can use sperm from a donor. The standard way of fertilizing an egg is to mix it with thousands of swimming sperm, one of which enters the egg. If the sperm count is low or if the sperm don't swim well, an alternative is to use a procedure called intracytoplasmic sperm injection, where a single sperm is injected into the egg. So once the eggs are fertilized, the cells begin to divide, forming embryos. And these are monitored for about three to five days. Now, IVF can be pretty costly, and health insurance doesn't always cover this. If you pay out of pocket, the hormone injections are four to $5,000. And um, all, everything that's involved in the rest of the procedure is somewhere between ten and $13,000. Now, they'll then take somewhere between one and several embryos to transfer to your uterus. Um, the rest are stored, um, are frozen and stored for you to use in the future. Now, the transfer will be done in an exam room. It's, there's no anesthesia. A few embryos are drawn up into a very thin, soft catheter which is passed through the vagina and cervix into the uterus. The embryos are released, the catheter is removed, 
and then you go back two weeks later to see if any of the embryos have implanted and you've become pregnant. Um, the embryo transfer costs about $4,000. Now, if you're transferring embryos and your ovarian function is um, not very high, they may um, give you hormones before the transfer to get your uterus prepared, and they may continue these hormones for the first three months of the pregnancy to help support the pregnancy. Now, the same process of transfer is also used if you froze embryos before your cancer treatment. Um, they would be thawed and transferred. Or if you froze eggs, they would be thawed and fertilized to create embryos and transfer. But the transfer process is exactly the same. Now, if you did freeze eggs or embryos before treatment, you may want to discuss with your reproductive endocrinologist if you're better off attempting to obtain fresh eggs for IVF or if you just go right ahead and use the frozen embryos or eggs. Now, the Society for Assisted Reproductive Technology collects data from all the centers in the United States that report their success rates. And this graph shows you the percentage of people who have a live birth with each transfer of the embryos. And the dark blue bars show success rates with fresh embryos and the light blue with the frozen embryos. And success rates are dependent on age. And these are not the age at which you do the transfer. They're the age at which you were when the eggs were collected. So this is something to consider if you froze eggs or embryos before your um, cancer treatment began. Um, before we switch over to talk about options for men, I want to mention something that women can consider if they're not yet ready to start their family but are concerned about future fertility based on the risk of premature ovarian failure. And, and hopefully this will address the woman who's 31 and worried about whether or not she should try to get pregnant now. And what, what this is, involves is doing egg or embryo freezing as a method of fertility preservation after treatment. And this is something that survivors should really consider if they're, um, you know, once they reach their, you know, late teens or early 20s, if there is a risk of early menopause and you know we're ready to start building a family but want to have a biologic a child in the future. Um, and so basically it's the same process of ovarian stimulation for 10 to 14 days, egg retrieval, fertilization of the eggs to create embryos if you are married, or um, you can just keep the eggs unfertilized and then freezing these eggs or embryos for future use if it turns out that when you're ready to actually build your family, you've lost ovarian function and aren't able to get pregnant on your own, you could then thaw these and use them at that time. However, you should wait at least one year after treatment to consider this. And of course, we need to discuss this with your oncologist um, first as well. Joanna had um, a question come in um, sort of related to this subject. Um, somebody wanted to know if there are specific tests to test the health or viability of eggs. So unfortunately, there's no way of testing eggs or sperm after treatment to see if they have been affected by the chemotherapy. However, there has been research looking at men and women who have had chemotherapy and waited at least one year from their last treatment, and there's no evidence that their children have a higher risk of genetic mutations or chromosomal problems or birth defects than what is seen in the general population. So because of this, we assume that the germ cells for the men or the eggs for the women, if they haven't been destroyed but they have been affected by the chemo, that they either fully repair themselves or they just break down and, and are non-functional. So we assume that the, the sperm and the eggs if, as long as you've waited a long, long enough time, are, have, have no damage. But there's no way of evaluating them. However, once you have an embryo in the laboratory, it is possible to take a single cell from the embryo and do a test called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. 
and you can look at the genes of the embryo to see if there are some known genetic mutations. They can't really screen an embryo for every possible problem, but they can screen it for some very specific genetic mutations. Wow, thank you. That's fascinating. I had no idea. Very cool. Okay, so I'm going to move on to men. And for those wanting to know about their fertility status, the first step for men would be to go to a sperm bank and obtain a semen analysis. This basically involves masturbating into a sterile cup to collect a specimen, and they'll examine the specimen under the microscope to count the number of sperm and evaluate their motility, basically looking at how well they swim. Now, if your semen shows that you have no sperm, that's referred to as azospermia, or very few sperm, referred to as oligospermia, or if after trying to conceive on your own and being unsuccessful after three to six months, then you should schedule an appointment with a reproductive urologist. These doctors can also be helpful <clears throat> if you have erectile dysfunction or ejaculation changes from your treatment to explore other ways of ensuring that you can deliver sperm to your partner. Um, They, um, they also can look at, um, they can do a hormone analysis because some, for some men after cancer treatment, testosterone levels can be altered or there may be pituitary gland dysfunction and these things can also affect fertility. So the reproductive urologist can help you with that analysis as well. Now, um, if your semen analysis has, shows that you have no sperm or very few sperm, there are a few options. If you were able to freeze sperm before treatment, you certainly can use that. However, your female partner will have to see a reproductive endocrinologist. And they will look at, when you freeze sperm before cancer treatment, they actually do a semen analysis on the pretreatment um, semen. And so the reproductive endocrinologist will look at the semen analysis. And depending on how many vials you collected and what your sperm count was, and the motility of the sperm, they will recommend the best option for you to give you the best chance of, um, of having a baby from the frozen sperm. So one option is intrauterine insemination, but I have to say that most people will not recommend this when you have frozen sperm and you're no longer producing sperm because, as I mentioned earlier, it can take six attempts to be successful. Most men who freeze sperm before treatment usually have no more than about 10 vials. And so you don't want to kind of waste any of that very precious specimen. So they'll usually recommend that you go on to have in vitro fertilization. It's more invasive for your female partner, but will give you a better chance of success. And the process for, for IVF is exactly what I described previously. Um, another option men can consider if they did not freeze sperm before treatment and have no sperm in their semen after treatment is testicular sperm extraction. This is an outpatient surgical procedure performed with anesthesia. A small incision is made in the scrotum so that the doctor can examine the testes to find areas where tubules may still be functioning and contain germ cells and sperm even though there's not enough to find in the semen analysis. Now, these areas of tissue are removed. They sometimes refer to this as testicular biopsies. And they take the tissue and look at it under the microscope. And if sperm are found, they're going to be extracted from the tissue. And you can see right here, this is a single sperm that they found. Um, and then it's used with ICSI to fertilize your partner's eggs. This is a relatively newer procedure, but there was a recent article published last year that shows that for some patients, this can be very effective. And they did a study looking at 73 patients, and uh, with 42% of the patients, they were able to get a live birth. Um, it's been most successful in, women, in men who were treated for testicular cancer. So now I'm going to speak about other options for both men and women. 
Um, so before I go into that, any specific questions about what I discussed for men? No, there were no questions specific to men. So if you and your partner are not able to get pregnant naturally or with stimulation and IVF, and you didn't collect and freeze eggs, embryos, or sperm before treatment, there are still ways you can become a parent. Third-party reproduction refers to the involvement of a third person to help you build a family. This can involve using donated eggs, embryos, or sperm from another person, or arranging for another woman to carry a pregnancy for you. So I'm going to start with donor eggs. These are generally donated by young women between the ages of 21 and about 30, and you can get donated eggs in a variety of ways. A number of reproductive endocrinologists or fertility centers have their own egg donor programs, or you can use a private egg donor agency. Now, either way, these donors are generally anonymous. They're screened to evaluate their physical and psychological health and also to assess their family health history. A legal agreement is made that includes some compensation that you have to make to the egg donor. Now, alternatively, you may have a relative or friend who's willing to donate for you, and this can be a good option for some women. However, it's important to be aware of potential issues that could arise in the future. For example, if some years later this person wants to become more involved in your child's life than you would like them to be. So to minimize the risk of problems like this, even though this person may have the best of intentions, it's really essential to have psychological screening and a formal legal arrangement between you and the donor. Now, if you are going to work with an egg donor, there are a number of things that you should be aware of. First, there are very few government requirements for testing and screening of donors. And although the American Society for Reproductive Medicine lists agencies that agree to practice according to professional standards, there's no oversight to ensure that, in fact, that they're compliant with these standards. So it's really important that if you're going to use um, a fertility, you know, an egg donor agency, that you try to work with one that's as reputable as possible. And so you may want to consider asking your reproductive endocrinologist or even a reproductive attorney for a recommendation um, to make sure you're working with a place that does follow these standards as closely as possible. So what's the process when you use donor eggs? So these eggs are usually collected right before you're ready to use them so that the eggs are fresh. So first, the prospective donors are screened, and once you select the donor you want to use, the legal and financial arrangements are worked out. Now, to ensure that multiple eggs can be retrieved from the donor, she'll undergo the same process I described earlier for IVF. She'll take medicine to stimulate her ovaries for about two weeks, and since you're not going to be getting pregnant naturally, at about the same time, you're going to start hormones to prepare your uterus to accept the embryo. Now, when the donor's eggs are mature, she's scheduled for the egg retrieval, and they're collected exactly as I described earlier, and then fertilized in the laboratory with the sperm of your male partner or sperm donor. And over the next few days, cells start to divide and grow, forming embryos. The embryos are then transferred into your uterus, and if you have extra embryos, you may, they can be frozen for you to use at a later time. You're tested about two weeks after the transfer to see if you've become pregnant, and you'll continue these supplemental hormones for several months to support the pregnancy. And then after that time, the placenta really takes over and makes the hormones that you need to, to continue to support the pregnancy. Now, with egg donation, although you're not genetically related to the child, your male partner is, and you can experience pregnancy and give birth. The cost of using donor eggs is about $30,000, and I know Mindy's going to talk more about this. Um, it includes your medical care, the donor's medical care, and compensation for the donor's time and effort. Sometimes two women share the eggs of a single donor to reduce the cost. There are also increasing numbers of centers and agencies that are now offering frozen eggs. However, at this time, those costs are not significantly less than with fresh eggs. Donor embryos are another option. 
Now, these are usually embryos that were created by couples who underwent fertility treatment. They've completed their family building and now have extra embryos, and they don't want to discard them. Some fertility centers have a program for embryo donation, and there are also several agencies that offer this. You should be aware, though, that most of these are faith-based and have pretty strict restrictions on who they will give these embryos to. However, there are some non-denominational embryo donation agencies as well. I have heard, this is completely, um, there's no data on this, but I have heard some reproductive endocrinologists expect express some concern about the quality of these embryos. Since when a couple goes through, through IVF to attempt pregnancy, they always start by using their best embryos and then move down to the lower quality embryos. So it raises the question as to whether these leftover embryos are good quality and will have the same chance of success. This is, using embryo donation is a really, really new thing, and so I think that if it's something you're considering, it may be a great option, but I would definitely, you know, ask your reproductive endocrinologist about this and, and how this may affect your success rates. Um, another option is to create an embryo using donor egg and donor sperm, um, and so that's another thing that you can consider. Um, there are minimal regulations and minimal oversight of donor embryo agency. So if this option seems like a good one to you, again, consider asking your fertility center or a reproductive attorney for a recommendation. Now, once the financial and legal um, issues are arranged, the process for the recipient is the same as with eggs. You start taking hormones to prepare your uterus. The embryo is thawed and transferred into your uterus. You'll test it about two weeks after the transfer to see if you've become pregnant and will continue to take hormones for a period to support the, the pregnancy. Again, you get to experience pregnancy and give birth, but with donor embryos, neither parent has a genetic link to the child. The cost may be less than with egg donation, but it's very hard to get this information since this is such a new family building option. Joanne, so we had a, a question come in um, when you mentioned a, the, starting with the highest quality embryos. Um, somebody wanted to know what is a quality embryo and who determines this? So when you undergo IVF, the egg is fertilized with sperm, and it takes – they keep them in the laboratory for three to five days to see the eggs um, – to see the cells divide and form the embryos. And we know that not all eggs are going to fertilize, and we know that not all fertilized eggs will actually create embryos. And in the embryology lab, they'll look at those final embryos, and there are all of these criteria that they use that are, to be honest, way beyond my expertise to describe to you. But there are all these um, things that they see under the microscope that help them evaluate how likely it is that these embryos will be successful. And they actually grade them. And so if you do have frozen embryos, you can actually they, – they can't do this with, with eggs, but they have a way of doing this with embryos. And it really has to do with all these genetic things that they see under the microscope. And so these are things that you could actually go back and ask your reproductive endocrinologist if you have embryos frozen, you know, were they um, – what grade were they? Um, and that, that can be helpful for you to know in terms of chances of success. Great. Thank you. Um, now, I just want to talk about donor sperm also as an option. Um, people have been using donor sperm to build families for many years, and there are many, many sperm banks around the country where you can obtain donor sperm. Uh, your wife or female partner will need to work with a reproductive endocrinologist, so I encourage you to ask her for a recommend ask the doctor, um, the reproductive endocrinologist, for a recommendation about which sperm bank they would suggest you um, look into. You can also, of course, obtain donor sperm from a friend or relative, but as I mentioned earlier, this can create pr potential problems in the future. Um, and again, it's really important that you both be carefully screened to ensure you're going into this with a full understanding of potential issues that can arise. The sperm are thawed, and intrauterine insemination is used to instill them into your partner's uterus 
And again, it can take three to six attempts to be successful. So don't be discouraged if it takes a bit of time. Now, surrogacy is an option for women who are unable to carry pregnancy. And as I mentioned earlier, it involves arranging for another woman to carry the pregnancy for you. Now, there are two types of surrogacy arrangements. With traditional surrogacy, the woman who carries the pregnancy is inseminated with sperm from your husband, the partner, or sperm donor, and the sperm fertilizes the surrogate's egg to create an embryo, and the surrogate carries the pregnancy and gives birth. Because it is her egg that is fertilized, the surrogate is the birth mother and the genetic mother. And so this creates potential legal risk for you because she has this genetic relationship. With gestational carriers, embryos are created through IVF using your eggs or donated eggs, fertilized by sperm from your husband, a partner, or a sperm donor. And the embryo is then transferred into the carrier's uterus, and she carries the pregnancy and gives birth. But because her egg was not used, the carrier is the birth mother, but she is not the genetic mother. And this is definitely more commonly used now than traditional surrogacy because the legal issues are, are much less complex. Now, most women, most couples find a carrier through an agency or a reproductive attorney who specializes in gestational carriers, and your fertility center may also be able to help you find a carrier. Sometimes a relative or friend will offer to carry pregnancy for you, and this is a good option for some women, but as we've talked about before, issues can come up, so screening is really critical. Carriers are generally uh, at least 21 years of age. They must have a previous delivery with a live child, a full term, um, and they must be screened both medically and psychologically. The laws related to surrogacy are complicated and vary widely from state to state. Not all states allow financial compensation for carriers. Now, that doesn't mean that if you live in a state like New York that doesn't allow compensation that you can't use a carrier. You just have to be sure you use a carrier who lives in a state where it is legal and she has to give birth in that state. States also uh, vary in how they define who the parent is, as well as specifics like whose name goes on the birth certificate, whether or not you need to adopt the child after birth, and on the rights of the genetic mother and the birth mother. There's been increasing use of international carriers. I've had a couple of patients tell me they want to go to India because they hear that that they can do it there and it's, it's much less money. However, I cannot overstate how complicated this is because of issues related to citizenship um, when your child is born overseas. So that's something you really need to consider. Because of the complexity of this issue, it is essential to work with an attorney who has expertise in this area. Using a carrier um, is also quite expensive. The cost can range between fifty dollars and $100,000. Um, although it's a great option for many people, third-party uh, reproduction is, is a complex undertaking. Adoption is, of course, another option for building a family. A lot of people think that if they have a history of cancer, they can adopt, and that is not true as long as you're cancer-free. Um, adoption is a great option, and um, there's going to be a webinar coming soon to tell you all about this in detail. Yep, that's actually going to be, I think it's going to be June 25th, which is two weeks from today, and we're going to be blasting out an announcement about that um, within the next day or so. So any questions before I kind of put closure on this? Um, I did have one question, and again, if you think it's a little more complicated, then I can certainly just put you in touch with the individual. Um, we had one gentleman ask on behalf of um, his wife if you could discuss any considerations specific to women who were treated for cancer prior to puberty. Um, and if there's any sort of special considerations or things that, that those survivors need to keep in mind. So um, with treatment prior to puberty, there really have been um, no options to preserve fertility. So um, some, there's been some evidence that because very young girls have so many more eggs, that they may be more likely to maintain fertility in the future. So, you know, certainly the first step would be to have a fertility evaluation to see if you still are fertile. 
Um, but another consideration would be that for prepubertal girls who have pelvic radiation, it can affect the growth of the uterus. And so if you're considering carrying a pregnancy and you've had pelvic radiation, it would be important to be evaluated to make sure that your uterus is able to carry a pregnancy. But other than, than that one issue, um, it, these options would be the same either way. Great, thank you very much. So where do you go from here? Um, obviously this presentation just gives you a very, very superficial overview of the options and you definitely need to learn more. There's great resources on the internet and I think um, the SAM Fund is gonna send you out a list of sites that we've put together that we think will be helpful for you to really investigate this in more depth. Um, I encourage you to speak with your oncologist before you finalize any plan. Let them know what you're considering, ask if the timing is right for you, and make sure they have no concerns based on your personal medical situation. Um, you know, I, I definitely would say that if you feel ready, I would definitely be evaluated to look at what your fertility status at, you know, is at the moment, even if you're not really ready yet to build a family, because these results will definitely um, help clarify your options for you. And obviously planning for the financial costs, and there are many of them, and Mindy's going to talk about those, so I'm not going to spend time on that. You may want to consider consulting with a reproductive attorney, um, particularly if you're considering third-party reproduction because of the legal, legal implications of having a third party involved and because state laws vary widely, and this is critical if you're considering surrogacy, but even with donor egg, embryo, or sperm, you, you may want to just kind of run your situation by an attorney who specializes in this. Um, you can ask your fertility center or an agency you're working with um, if they can recommend an attorney for you. Um, if on the list of resources, you're going to see some websites where you can go to find an attorney. And when you select someone, you really want to consider their experience, what state they're licensed in, what other services they provide, and how they charge for their services. You also may want to consider um, a consultation with a mental health specialist. If you're not able to get pregnant naturally, the process of building a family is complicated, time-consuming, and costly. And going through this process can elicit feelings of anger, of loss, and of grief. If you are finding that these emotions become overwhelming to you, if they persist for many weeks, or if they're paralyzing you and making it difficult for you to take the next steps, professional counseling can be very helpful. And again, on the um, list of resources that we're going to be providing afterwards, there are some websites where you can find a mental health specialists who specialize in issues related to infertility. We know that the process of building a family after cancer treatment can be complicated, and it takes persistence and endurance. But as you walk down this path, keep in mind that many people have passed through before you and have been successful. And I hope this information will be helpful as you start on your own journey. And that's it. Joanne, thank you so, so, so much. I know everybody on this webinar is um, in listen-only mode, but I know that I speak for everyone when I just say thank you. That was a ton of information that you provided really clearly. Um, hopefully it gave everyone on this call a good starting point. And for anyone who's listening to this webinar as a recording after the live presentation, if you would like access to any of the resources that Joanne mentioned or the ones that Mindy is about to mention, you can feel free to email us at webinars at thesamfund.org. So with that, we will shift gears a little bit and introduce Mindy Berkson, who's going to go more in depth about um, the cost of these different processes as well as ideas to finance them. Because as you alluded to, Joanne, they're expensive. But the, the silver lining here for anyone who's listening to this webinar is that there are resources out there to be able to help you. And so Mindy like Joanne did, will provide a starting point um, and give you resources to look into further. And if you have questions afterwards, you can feel free to contact us and we'll get you linked up with the right people. So, Mindy, thank you so much for, for conducting this part of the presentation and we'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction and um, thank you all for joining us today. 
I thought I'd start just very, very briefly about um, infertility consulting and what I do because it does play into so much that Joanne just mentioned. And um, I think everyone realizes there are many pieces to this puzzle that need to fit together when you're embarking on a, the family building journey, especially when you're using third party reproduction. And the focus of my practice is vastly, the vast majority of my practice is focused on using surrogates, egg donors, egg freezing. Um, but for each of my clients that come to my table, I have a very individualized approach to helping them. At some point during the consultations, many consultations that we have together, I am addressing physical, financial, and emotional issues. So there is no cookie cutter consultation because it is so specific to individualized situations. My role as an infertility consultant um, first starts with identifying the egg donors and surrogates. And how I do this is through a vast network of agencies that I have pre-vetted, vetted in that I request special perks for my clients from their agencies. Special perks include reduced agency fees. Sometimes if they allow me to negotiate um, compensation rates with egg donors and surrogates if I feel that they're out of line or higher than ASRM standards. ASRM, as Joanne mentioned, is the Association for Reproductive Medicine. Um, and then also what I require from these agencies is that they vet their candidates. So if their candidate doesn't pass the medical screening or the, re or the psychological evaluations that are necessary in third-party reproduction or simply the candidate drops out of the process, I require that these agencies refund agency fees. And in my role as an advocate, this is what I have learned has really been the primary differentiator between me and working through a typical recruiting agency. So one piece of the puzzle in third party is definitely pulling together the candidates. Another piece is um, finding the reproductive specialists, the embryologists who have above national average success rates, which are very important because maximizing your chances of success early on in the process always helps to minimize financial expenditures. I also pull together teams of attorneys attorneys that are state-specific because the surrogacy laws vary dramatically from state to state. And um, the laws where your surrogate resides and where she delivers will um, be dictated by that particular state law and therefore you need an attorney in that state to draft contracts for you. Um, Andy, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wanted you to remember that I have your presentation here, so if you need me to switch between slides, we're still at the cover slide. Okay, I know. Give me two okay. minutes and we'll be at the next slide. No, you're all set. <laughs> that's fine. I just wanted you to remember. That's all. Yeah. Keep going. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, I work very closely with insurance agents to help garner policies for surrogates because this is one of the things that really drives up the cost of surrogacy. Um, so kind of an overview of my role as an infertility consultant. My presentation today is solely going to focus on financing the fertility treatment, but I, I went through that long explanation because I need you to realize that financing is just one piece of the puzzle when you're looking to third-party reproduction. So um, the, the one thing I want to mention, too, before I move to the next slide is that I'm a newly elected board member of an organization called Fertile Action, and Fertile Action is um, the, the mission of this charitable organization is to eradicate costs for cancer patients. And so through networks of reproductive endocrinologists and embryologists and, and pharmaceutical companies, we have arrangements to really help cancer patients find reduced fees for their treatment options. Of course, those treatment options are very specific to individual situations. But if any of you have any questions about Fertile Action, feel free to go to the website, fertileaction.org, or give me a call directly at, you know, at any time. Okay, can we move to the next slide? Okay, so my first slide, when I'm helping my clients to, before embarking on the journey, we always plan and prepare um, financially. And the first step to that is reviewing your existing insurance benefits. 
these benefits vary from policy to policy. I would say, in general, benefits are limited when it comes to fertility treatment. Limited meaning some states only give you a certain number of treatment cycles, where other policies will offer uh, a limited dollar amount. And uh, because treatment options tend to be very expensive, benefits overall tend to be very limited. But it is important to investigate what ins existing insurance benefits you do have so that you can plan and prepare for multiple treatment cycles. Um, investigating these options up front will help you to effectively plan and prepare for out-of-pocket expenses. And this is what I call working within the system to take advantage of absolutely every benefit available, which will help you defray costs in the long run. Can you switch slides, please? Okay, based on my um, personal and professional experience, I can tell you that in order to maximize your chances of success and minimize your financial expenditure, it's necessary to make educated decisions versus emotionally driven decisions because there are so many financial decisions to be made throughout this process. But being able to make educated decisions is very, very empower empowering and helps bring back the loss of control that many of my clients feel throughout this process. Um, in the same way that there's not one blanket medical solution for each individual seeking treatment, there's also not one blanket financial for solution for how to fund your fertility treatment. So today we're going to address how to set parameters for borrowing and also the options that are available outside of fertility center financing and insurance. Next slide. Each day I work very closely with my clients to evaluate these individual needs and how they affect their emotional, physical, and financial concerns. So it's important for me to discuss with my clients the end family building goal because very often clients come to me wanting more than just one child. And also, the end family building goal, it's important in case there's a failed attempt, we need to know that there are resources in place to fall upon plan B. It's also important to think about the total costs that are associated with the treatment cycle, because it's more than just paying for the actual medical costs especially in third party where there's legal costs, travel costs, compensation costs, donor and surrogate, insurance costs, um, et cetera. So I always help my clients to balance hope with caution by planning for multiple cycles. I also ask my, my clients to think about guidelines and milestones for treatments. And let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Um, currently, I'm working with a woman who is 42 years old. And she was given a 10% chance of success if she were to use her own eggs through the in vitro fertilization process. She was given a 65% chance of success if she would choose the treatment options using donor eggs. And so I asked my client to consider where are your dollars best spent? And how much time and money do you put at a, at a treatment cycle which may only yield a 10% chance of success? before you put money at a treatment cycle, which can in increase your chances of success significantly. So how do we best maximize this chance of success while minimizing the financial overall expenditure? And I think it's these milestones and guidelines that help clients know when to change the course of treatment. Next slide. Okay, so once you have this general guideline for the treatment course, I think it's very important to speak with a financial planner or a tax advisor um, because borrowing options always come with relevant impl tax implications or restrictions. And these relevant tax implications can affect your overall credit score and it can limit your liquidity, which can greatly impact your access to emergency funds. Next slide. So after the insurance benefits are evaluated, there are a few basic ways to, to get money. And I wish I could wave, wave my magic wand and say there are so many options out there. But 
unfortunately, they are limited, and um, options also have to be suitable to individualized situations. So I want to divide this slide kind of in two categories. The first one is savings. And obviously, this is either money that you've set aside in a savings account or investments that are being sold from your portfolio. If you're selling stocks or bonds, it's important to make sure that you understand all the associated tax consequences. And again, I must reiterate here the importance of speaking with a financial planner or a tax professional who can offer you guidance specific to your individualized financial circumstances. And of course, I always recommend having a safety net of savings, either in cash or investments. Next slide. The second category that I wanted to talk about is borrowing. I think loans are fairly straightforward, but it's also important to shop around for the best available rates. Since rates are linked to your current credit score, rates can vary greatly. So it's important to keep in mind that any loan you take out can further decrease your credit score. So make sure you understand all the terms of the loans and know that you can meet your monthly payments comfortably without putting your family in jeopardy. Next slide. Many fertility centers across the country offer financing programs. I like to call these distributed risk programs because the fertility centers are really distributing the risk between you and themselves. And let me back up and explain what these distributed risk programs are. They're, you may also know them as shared risk programs. And of course, the fees and the rules for each program vary from clinic to clinic, so I'm going to be speaking very generally about this. But these, a distributed risk program means that you can purchase upfront a guaranteed number of cycles for a set fee. The bottom line with these programs is that if you become pregnant on the first attempt, then you've overpaid for the cycle. But if you become pregnant on a subsequent attempt, then you've paid less per cycle than you would by purchasing individual cycles. Many of these programs also offer partial or full refunds if a live birth is not achieved. So I think that's a very important point to evaluate when you're considering um, distributed or shared risk programs from center to center. Now, be again, because they're so specific to each center, I'm not going to go into great detail here, but I think it's important to, to really evaluate what's available at the fertility center, maybe even before you start with a bank loan. Next slide. Um, HELOC stands for Home Equity Line of Credit, and this has been a very popular borrowing option in the past, and the main reason is, first, the interest you pay is deductible on your federal tax return, and the second is, you don't have to use all of the borrowed money at one time, and I think this is really important when you're setting financial reserves aside for more than just one cycle. But as I mentioned previously, it's important to compare rates because the rates that are offered by your current mortgage lender may not be the best rates available. The other problem or difficulty with HELOC loans today is that in the past few years, given the downturn in our economy, these loans have become much more difficult to secure. Next slide. Loans that have become um, more available um, are, these aren't really loans, but these are op another option to pay through health savings accounts. Sometimes these are also called flexible spending accounts. And what these are, it are pre-tax savings accounts. They're typically offered through your employer, but they're now also offered um, with, through some major medical insurance companies. Um, you could purchase a a plan that has a HSA option attached to it. You typically, through the employer, you set up this account at the beginning of your benefit period. And at that time, you could also declare the amount of money that you choose to set aside for health care expenses. The maximum amount that you could fund this account is $6,050 for a married couple and $3,050 for an individual. 
Now, exactly how the account is funded may depend on your company, so it's very important to talk to the Human Resources Division. But typically, a set amount is taken out of your paycheck monthly, and this allows you to use pre-tax dollars to pay for costs associated with health care expenses up to the IRS-mandated quota. Now, many of my clients have benefited from using this account to pay for medical costs related to donor and surrogacy expenses, but be aware that it is very important to consult your tax professional to determine what expenses are eligible according to the IRS and also how this could impact your individual tax situation. Um, another important point to note here is that since infertility coverage and associated costs are often a gray area for the IRS, many companies that allow for HSA accounts to pay for these costs, there are many that do cover these costs and many companies that don't cover these costs. So, once again, very important to connect with your HR department to make sure you know exactly what your HSA would be available for. Next slide. Another option that I, I don't necessarily consider a very good option, but it is an option, is dipping into retirement accounts. And I always caution my clients that there are many real, real ramifications when you're considering this ramifications that have dramatic and negative long-term effects. The IRS does have provisions which allow for borrowing out of retirement accounts for health care costs, and these provisions are known as hardship withdrawals or unforeseen emergencies. In order to qualify, you must formally petition either your employer or, in the case of an IRA account, the individual managing institution. If you do receive approval to qualify for these health care loans, then the amount you withdraw must be repaid to the account within a set time frame. If you do not qualify for an approved health care loan, you can still borrow from the retirement account. However, the amount of the funds, the penalty, and the payback period associated with the loan will depend on the type of loan you get and also the type of account you have. So, I have to urge you to always speak with your tax professional so you can make certain that you understand the rules as they apply to your individual account, your individual situation, and how this is going to impact your tax situation. Next slide. Uh, Joanne had mentioned that uh, exploring surrogacy is uh, um, one of the most expensive treatment options available and um, therefore it's a little bit necessary to do more extensive or creative financing. In an effort to address the changing needs of my surrogacy clients in these past few years, I have formed an alliance with a healthcare financing company which enables Lotus Blossom to provide loans for surrogacy clients up to $35,000 at 0% interest. The cost to service this loan is a $10 administration fee per month, and the loans are available for terms up to 24 months. Of course, applicants have to um, meet the qualifications of the loans, and that's through a credit check. Um, the, op the opportunity, though, has greatly helped many of my clients to more easily afford the cost of surrogacy and medical treatment, and overall has proven to be a better option than incurring credit card debt especially given the favorable 0% interest rate. The next slide. Thank you. Um, costs for infertility treatment are high, and there is no guarantee for any one treatment cycle. So it's very important to plan prudently for the end family building goal and not just one cycle. I always encourage my clients to balance hope with caution emotionally, physically, and financially. And I think one of the most important things we can do to build the foundation for treatment is to take into consideration the backup plans and how we're going to stretch the budget over time to meet the end family building goal. Next slide. 
um, available on my website is a complimentary ebook all about financing fertility treatment. And in that book is an outline of many questions that you should ask your insurance company. Um, also an outline in that book is a discussion of many of these options that I talked about here, as well as questions to take to your HR department. So please feel free to download that. Um, the homepage of my website is lotusblossomconsulting.com. Thanks so much, Mindy. We have um, a couple of questions that have come in. I'm not sure if they're um, appropriate or if they, one of them in particular I think might be um, good to consult the reference that you just um, provided about the insurance company. But the first question was, does the type of or risk level of infertility determine the, what the insurance company, uh, whether or not they will pay for your fertility treatment? Uh, usually not linked to the, the risk level of your fertility treatment. It's more based on... Um, if you come from a mandated state and you meet the qualifications of the mandated um, state's policy. So, for example, a mandated state means you work for a company that has more than 25 people and your company is not self-funded. Mm -hmm. um, those states typically allow a certain set number of cycles. It doesn't matter what is involved in that treatment cycle, it's just considered a treatment cycle. So, for example, it could be your own IVF cycle or it could be a donor IVF cycle that would be covered under that mandated policy. Um, if your insurance, if you're self-employed, the chances of you having coverage like that are, are more limited and usually policies will say you have a $10,000 or $15,000 limit for infertility. And of course, I'm speaking in generalities here. But again, that ten or $15,000 limit can be used towards any type of treatment cycle. Great. Thank you. And um, we have one more question about, um, which we can actually speak to a little bit on our end, which was, um, what about scholarships or grants for people wanting, um, seeking out assistance for helping with their infertility costs? Mm -hmm. There are grants available. They are certainly limited, and um, you have to apply for them. And, of course, the time frame for application and um, reward may not fit into the time frame that you have in mind for treatment. Um, but there are some available. Uh, there's a, my own company, Jude Andrew Adams Charitable Fund, is on the front page of my website under Charitable tab, and the application can be submitted online. That's available for your own IVF cycle. It's not available for a third-party cycle. Great. Well, Mindy, thank you so much for all of this information. Hopefully it gave um, participants a good place to start. I think you covered a lot of different ways to finance um, what can be a really costly procedure, and I have no doubt that it was empowering and informative to everybody. So on behalf of all of our participants, thank you so much. Um, just to wrap things up, I did want to mention the SAM Fund Grants Program. For those of you who are on this webinar and don't know anything about the SAM Fund, besides our webinar, our biggest program is a grants program, and we provide financial assistance once per year. It's a two-part application process, and the application happens to be available now. It was just posted last week on our website, www.thesamfund.org. The due date is Monday, July 9th for Part 1. And as part of that grants program, we do provide a small number of grants for family building. Um, the strongest candidates for those grants are ones who have already started the process or are ready to start the process. Our grants average about 2000 to 2500 for family building. And we can certainly answer more questions about that if you want to email grants at thesamfund.org. But like Mindy just mentioned, the, um, the downside to that is that we don't generally award funds until mid-November to the end, of the end of the month of November when our two-part review process is over. So for people who need money right now, we probably wouldn't be the best resource, but we do have a list of other organizations that provide grants. So you can certainly email us at grants at thesamfund.org and we will tell you what we know. So with that, I'll wrap up the webinar with huge thanks again to Joanne and Mindy for taking time to share all of your expertise and information with all of our participants. We just really appreciate it so much, and 
um, to everyone who participated in today's webinar or might be listening to a recording afterwards. We hope that you found this helpful. We are here to help in any way we can after the presentation is done, so feel free to email us anytime and we can link you up with Joanne or maybe or the appropriate resources in the cancer community as well as the fertility community. So the one thing that we do ask those of you that are on this uh, webinar or listening to it afterwards is that you complete a short post-webinar survey. The link you'll see on your screen right now, um, surveymonkey.com slash s slash fb1 post. <laughs> You're actually going to receive an email tomorrow with that link in it so you don't have to scramble to copy it down, but we figured we'd put it up there anyway for you now. And really the purpose of that, all of your answers are kept confidential. The purpose of our surveys is just to make sure that this webinar program meets your needs, and we really do take your feedback um, seriously and we are continually revisiting the program and revamping it as best we can so that it is, is as effective and as helpful to you as possible. So if you have any questions or if you have ideas for future topics that you'd like to see addressed in this webinar series, just shoot us an email at webinars at thesamfund.org and one of us will get back to you. So thank you again, Mindy and Joanne, and thank you to everyone who participated. Thank you.